My name's Greg Turnquist. Uh, I work on the spring team at Pivotal. Um, I'm the author of Learning Spring Boot, and there's actually a video-based version of that coming out this fall. So if you want to find out about that, I'll shamelessly plug, go, go to my website, gregalternquist.com, and, and sign up to find out about, to hear about that coming. Um, so I want to jump in and say, you know, what do you do if you need to deploy something like 2,000 commits a day? That's the volume about, that's the velocity that Netflix does today, is they have over 2,000 commits a day. Um, what if you've, you know, entered into the microservice space and, you, you know, you, instead of having one big monolith that uh, you're deploying, you, you have a lot of different uh, complicated services. And you need to do stuff like scaling, you know, different times of the day you need to ramp up or ramp down based on traffic and things like that. Now, your team may have gotten really good at building artifacts, either you're using Jenkins or perhaps you're using Travis for doing build jobs, but, you know, there's, there's more to deployment than just building artifacts. Um, maybe you could be in a shop where you have some complex deployment procedures. Your QA team has written a 23-page acceptance test procedure, uh, something I definitely faced at my uh, previous job. Um, and everybody today wants options, options, options. Maybe uh, some of you are using Pivotal Cloud Foundry, some of you could be using some of the other cloud foundries that are out there. Maybe you're using Amazon or some of these other cloud providers. Everybody wants flexibility, but you want to be able to use essentially sort of the same tool suite. So your, your investment in building a deployment strategy uh, isn't something you have to rip up and throw away uh, if you're going to migrate to a different cloud solution. Um, I have a little math here. I went and did some computations because I actually didn't realize the scale of what this is. Um, you know, I, I once worked for a company where we got a deployment out about every three months, and that you know, we had to bring in the whole team. It, it was an all-night job, but that was no big deal. Um, but you go into microservices and maybe you start doing 10 services, and you get once a day because you start to get into continuous develop, uh, uh, integration and stuff. Well, the scale factor becomes 900 times whatever that effort was. And if you start to move it up to, say, maybe you get out 10 times a day, it goes up to 9,000, and even... You know, if you have some 20, 20 different microservices and, and developers are pushing out all these tiny changes, it suddenly comes an enormous uh, scalability factor when you're trying to do deployments like this. Um, at some point, somebody's going to say, that 23-page procedure that QA wrote for us two years ago is not cutting it. And we need, to, we need a way to get our arms around it and figure out where are the inefficiencies in our process. The solution to that, if you, of course you could guess, was uh, Spinnaker. This is kind of a quick summary of what it, what it is, what it has. There's, there's a lot more depth to go into that we're not going to cover. But uh, essentially, it's a pipeline-based engine for doing uh, continuous deployment. It supports deploying to multiple clouds in the same pipeline. And by that, I mean, you know, I've got logos for all the different supported platforms that it handles with Cloud Foundry at the top, but you, know, you can recognize some of these other clouds. You can have one pipeline that in one step could be deploying to OpenStack and in the next, next step can deploy to uh, Cloud Foundry. Uh, it's that flexible, so it's all in one place. So there's no sense of, I need Spinnaker over here to talk to Kubernetes and I need another instance of Spinnaker to talk to Amazon Web Services. Uh, it uh, has things like uh, uh, various triggers, like you can uh, have, have it triggered by a Jenkins CI job. That's what uh, Netflix happens to use in their shop. But uh, a lot of people are, are picking up Travis uh, as a popular tool, so they can also trigger based off a Travis job and some other things. Uh, some of the stages they have include what they call baking images or finding images, and that's where if you need to take a, a jar file and bundle it up in a Debian package and stuff it inside an Amazon machine image, and that's what your deployment artifact is. Or if you're using something like Pivotal Cloud Foundry, all you need to do is get the jar file and push the jar file out to your target uh, deployment environment. Um, there's also things like manual judgments. There may be certain steps in your process you need the pipeline to pause and go for human intervention. You know, at this stage, go to QA and tell QA to go run their 23-page acceptance procedure and then come back and uh, bless the pipeline to proceed. You know, and a big thing definitely in this day and age that a lot of people have had to hand cobble together in the past is absolutely zero time upgrades. Um, anytime I go talk to like government contracting and stuff, you know, you start talking about five nines of availability and this kind of stuff where you need uptime, uptime, uptime. Spinnaker definitely supports that kind of stuff. And um, a big key feature is it has notifications. You can have notifications over a whole pipeline or over the individual steps where you can have 
email, SMS. I added Slack support because we moved to Slack without hip chat. So that's enough for like a, a quick speed up uh, introduction, but let's go and jump over to an actual deployment that I have. So uh, I'm going to, here I have a copy of a Pivotal CF running and uh, over here in my dev space, I actually have all the modules for Spinnaker deployed. So I'm actually running this deployment uh, on PCF, which means my deployment does not depend upon conference Wi-Fi. <laughs> but uh, I actually have a couple spaces over here, a staging space and a production space. But I'm not gonna actually run it from uh, PCF. Instead, I'm gonna go over here to, to Spinnaker. So uh, here's the UI where I can look at. I have a, a, a demo uh, that I built on using Spring Data Rest. I'm a Spring developer. I like to write Spring apps. So I have a demo app here that um, I have installed into staging and installed into production. And what I want to do is go look at the pipeline definition that I have here. I have uh, two different pipelines, deploy to staging and deploy to production. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually launch this because the entire installation procedure is gonna take about 10 minutes and I want that running in the background while we can go look at it. Now normally I would be triggered by some kind of build job but for demo purposes I'm just gonna manually uh, launch the pipeline. So what is it doing? Well, while that's running, let's go take a peek here at this pipeline definition. It's a series of chain steps up here, and it starts on the left-hand side with a trigger. Um, this says GitHub. You can be triggered by a GitHub event if, if you want to, but you could also just as well pick uh, Jenkins. You know, down here you could pick a Jenkins. Uh, uh, I don't have uh, the Travis stuff uh, flipped on in this configuration in particular, but you can also have one pipeline trigger another pipeline, and that's what my second pipeline actually does. Uh, in this pipeline, what it does is it does, it deploys my app into staging. So if you're familiar, you know, I'm assuming a lot of people in this room will probably use Cloud Foundry to some degree. Um, it's essentially like doing a CF push job. So push it up into my, into my staging space. The next step is I want it to go and disable what's called the, the, the old server group. In Spinnaker, we refer to these uh, instances as server groups. So uh, disable the old one so all the traffic is gonna go to the new one. And then the idea is I want QA to go out and actually do their test procedure against that. Now over here we have the run, run your QA acceptance test procedures. Uh, this is what's called a manual judgment. It means that the pipeline will pause at this point and somebody needs to come and, and run it. Um, I don't have notifications switched on for this demo, but this is a, a great opportunity to have a notification like on a Slack channel, publish, publish it to the QA Slack channel and say, hey, somebody needs to go out to, the, uh, go out to the lab or they have access from their desktop and go start running the acceptance test procedures and then come back here and check yay or nay if it passed or failed. Now, they can fail, they, they can fail it right there and then that's the end of the pipeline and it's deemed a failure if they say it doesn't pass the thing. So they can go back and report to the, to the development team, hey, there's, there's a flaw, go fix your code. But if they say, uh, it passed. In this case, we're going to say, since this is just staging, we only need to keep the, co the latest copy around in staging. So go ahead and destroy the old server group. So let's go back up and look at the one that's in progress. So right here, we get a nice little indicator bar for each of these uh, stages. And I can go click on one of these individ the individual step for deploy to staging, and it tells me it's succeeded here. I can zoom in here and it tells me that it's created this, this version of the app. The name of my app uh, is called SDR Demo and that's short for Spring Data Rest Demo because that's uh, one of the projects that I work on with uh, the Spring team. But in this case, I'm, I'm deploying an instance of SDR Demo but it's in the staging space. So I've uh, branded it as staging and here's a, a specific version number that it's rolling out. If I go over and peek in the staging space, I can get another perspective of this. <coughs> uh, what we hear we can see is there's two copies of the app. There's version 10 and now there's version 11 that's going out. Uh, version 11 has been enabled, version 10 is disabled, and this is how we implement uh, what's called immutable infrastructure. Uh, one of the powers that 
Cloud Foundry comes with and there's talks and blog articles about are blue-green deployments. The idea that I can, I can push out this version and then this version and I can keep alternating between the two by pushing a, you know, to the inactive version and then switching the route back and forth. The idea with Spinnaker is you take blue-green deployments and you, and you, you know, take it to the limits as far as you want to go. But instead of pushing and updating a current app, you push out an entirely new app. You do not go back and update existing stuff because that would be a mutable infrastructure. So instead, go push out version 11. If version 11 turns out to be buggy and stuff, roll back to version 10, delete version 11, and then later on when they roll it out, push out version 12. So it completed, it completed step two, which was disable old server group, and that's what we were able to see peaking at Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And I got a lot of details in for, you know, information. In the deployment step, I, we, I zoomed in and saw version 11 was being deployed. I can zoom into this disable step and see that it went to disable version 10 for me. Um, now we're at this other, we're at this next stage, uh, which is in yellow. So this is the message we would post out through our notification channel is go and run your 23 page test procedure and then come back here to indicate whether it's pass or fail. <coughs> this is what I call a demo of a, this is a, a semi-complex pipeline because probably in reality, if you're doing this kind of stuff, you would probably have multiple manual judgments. For example, the first manual judgment may be once it's out to staging, the development team needs to go out and run a smoke test against it. If the smoke test passes, then go have another manual judgment for QA. If QA says it checks out, maybe they need another manual step to route it through CM. And maybe QA and CM are operating in parallel to, parallel to go complete their checkmark paperwork forms, whatever. Uh, and then they might send it back to some other team. But you get the idea, you can have the pipeline pause for you and track this stuff. Um, I like the idea of having, you know, email notifications for this kind of stuff. So, you know, management can look at this and say, hmm, QA team's gotten 20 emails in the past two days about going and running tests. That's either an indication that our procedure is too laborious and we need to go make it more efficient and we need to trim out unnecessary stuff, or that is exactly the oversight that we want to do. The procedure's doing what we want it to do. And, Let's management keep their arms around what is happening while still letting you get some of the benefit of continuous deployment. So I'm going to say I ran the test procedure and it went great. So since it's good, it's going to go on to the last step of this pipeline, which is destroy old server group. And so, you know, they have rules in here. Some of the other stuff that they have support for is you can put, uh, you know, rescale the app, scale up, scale down. Um, another, another big feature that a lot of people are interested in is canary testing. So what if you got to production and uh, we're like, well, we need to run, we need to run 10% of all the traffic to the new copy, but keep, let's keep 90% of the traffic going to the old copy for a certain amount of time. You can definitely put in the steps into your pipeline today with like Cloud Foundry where you say, um, let's scale up the old copy to nine instances and run just one instance of the new copy. And because they're both mapped to the same route in Cloud Foundry, it's going to load balance 10% of the traffic to the new copy. So you can get some uh, canary testing right there. And then you could put a, a manual step in there to, to say, come back after three hours and verify that it worked out OK. And if it did OK, let's move along and scale down and, just, and destroy the old copy. <coughs> Sorry. That pipeline's finished, so we had a successful deploy to staging. If I go, if I go again, uh, recheck now, it got rid of version 10, so now we're up to version 11. What I have is down here, I have my deploy to production pipeline. It has two different, it has two steps in it. Um, the first step is called find image, and it says I'm not gonna specify the artifact that needs to be deployed because instead, I want it to go find the latest copy in staging. Whatever version you just deployed to staging is the copy I want to now deploy to production. So what it'll, it'll go do is look out and say, here's all the metadata that was associated with that copy in staging. 
In this case, it was a, uh, my artifact was hosted in S3. Uh, go, go fed, uh, so go give me the, the details on that and then carry them over to this deploy to production step. So earlier we saw SDR demo dash staging dash V011. This is the production copy that we're, that we're rolling out. This one has a slightly different strategy on deployments, and I'm gonna, we can go into the pipeline to see what it's doing exactly. So if we look at the top here, starting from the left, we can see what its trigger is. It's, in this case, it's triggered by a pipeline. And this says, it's a pipeline, it's triggered by application SDR demo, and the pipeline is, if deployed staging is successful, then kick this off. So find the latest copy from staging. So here I've entered in, you know, here's the description so people can understand what it means, but it says go into the staging space or the staging account, uh, pick this particular cluster name and go find the newest copy for me. Uh, there's, other, there's other rules like what do you want? Do you want the oldest? Do you want the largest? Um, do you want the failing copy? It's, they have options for that kind of stuff. So go get that, those bits of information, and then now let's go to deploy to production and run that. Here's what's the, uh, this is the information about what gets deployed. And if I, if I click this edit, I can look at the details here. So this says you're gonna send it to this named account uh, production, which in my configuration of Spinnaker is pointing to the production space I have in PCF dev with the necessary credentials. And it's, this is using what's called a red-black deployment strategy. That's just another name for a blue-green blue deployment. So essentially it says, and here I get to specify how many total copies do you want for us to maintain, for your, to roll back. And I say two copies, one active, and one predecessor. But you could type in 10 and it will keep the last 10 copies. And at any time you can go into Spinnaker and say, I need to roll back, and it'll pop up and say, which version do you need to roll back to? And it'll essentially do all the operations you would be doing by hand through uh, something like Apps Manager. Uh, there's other settings in here if I need to de declare the services that I want it to bind to. In this case, this is a Cloud Foundry specific deployment step. So these are Cloud Foundry specific parameters like service to bind to, environment variables, build pack overrides. But if one of my accounts was AWS, I would see a AWS specific set of collection of settings all from the same tool set. So it's actually in the time span that I was talking about it, it actually completed this release. I can go and I can zoom in to see, you know, what version did it publish out here. It uh, finished with production V011. Uh, I can actually click on this link and it's going to take me into this view and it's going to show me sort of a, a filtered down view of what's uh, out in my PCF spaces. So it's just showing me uh, production and this particular instance. Now if you notice, the, uh, there's a lot of integration between the various pro cloud providers, and you'll notice this is a little bitty Cloud Foundry icon with a little top clipped off of it, uh, shown with a nice green health status. But if you're using something like, you know, if you're deploying to Kubernetes, you'll see their little icon in there too, so you can tell what kind of instances are running. But if I go and clear, you know, if I clear out all these settings, uh, let me get, so I'm gonna clear all these filters. Um, here I'm able to, to flange down on, you know, this is the application. Uh, here's in production, I have two copies running, the current one active, the previous one disabled. Staging, I have one copy. And this is the kind of view where if you get into a microservice-based solution where you've deployed five different microservices, you can, you can filter down on something like only, sh only show me production or only show me staging, things like that. Versus if I, was, if I was looking at this view and I had actually 10 different microservices with three different versions, I would have 15 rows here and it would be a lot harder to see what the relationship was between all the services.
Um, this is some reference information I put into the slide deck, so if anybody wants to look at the slides later, you can, uh, it helps kind of explain some of the Spinnaker terminology that we have to map onto each of the cloud providers, including Cloud Foundry. So they talk about things like applications and clusters and server groups and load balancers, and uh, it's, you have to understand the language to be able to make sure we're speaking about the same thing, because a Spinnaker application does not map to a Cloud Foundry application. When we're talking about Cloud Foundry apps, we're talking about Spinnaker server groups. And one other key thing that I wanted to be sure to cover in this talk is um, the fact that we now have a one-click deployer built. So I've, uh, I've been working for about a month on building this application so that uh, if, you're using a, if you're using any Cloud Foundry, I know this, uh, this has PCF Spinnaker deployer on it, but you can actually point this app at any Cloud Foundry that's using the public, the uh, uh, certified APIs. And you can come in here and fill out the uh, settings that you need uh, to configure, such as the instance of Redis that Spinnaker's gonna talk to. And you can come down here and, and click our big deploy all button and it will install all of Spinnaker into your PCF environment. So in that sense, I can put Spinnaker into PCF so it can in turn deploy to PCF. And then the big goal is to take this app and actually install it into PCF. So that, that's three layers of indirection, then we're definitely in getting into inception. Uh, I don't know if you had any questions. One thing I did want to point out here, if you couldn't see, is I do have some, uh, some Spinnaker stickers to give away. You can come see me after the presentation and you can get a Spinnaker sticker. You can put it on your laptop, uh, put it on your, if you don't want to do that like me, then go put it on your children's toy laptop so they can be cool and hip with their friends and get the, get the kids talking about Spinnaker. Um, I did want to throw in here, you know, um, if, for, you know, if anyone's got questions, but uh, we are, I'm gonna be talking about this again at the Spring One Platform Conference, which is in the beginning of uh, August. Um, I have a few links here if you wanna go look at it. Um, I don't know if we had any questions, because I know this is a, a different audience than from what the last time I gave a Spinnaker talk to, and so I didn't know if anybody had questions about this. Yeah. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Do I have a time for Spinnaker on piece? Tide. Tide. Oh, tile. Okay. So the question is: Is is there a tile for deploying Spinnaker to PCS? Uh, in short, this this essentially is our solution for a tile. Uh, um, so the the this is actually a Spring Boot application that will install Spinnaker, and this is um, this is what we're doing to build instead of a tile. And so this is the, I'm making sure this operates. Uh, tiles are really critical stuff if you have to do a lot of under the hood magic or something with uh, installing stuff into PCF or in the, um, but in this case, Spinnaker is really just a handful of Spring Boot applications to deploy. So it was actually much more rapid for me to build this uh, tool for installing it. And this is where I'm working with my program managers to exactly how we're going to hand this out to the community. Like are we gonna, are we gonna list this artifact on network.pivotal.io for people to pull down and push into their system or not? Um, or you know, do we need, do we need a, a basically bare bones tile that will wrap this app up and, and push it for you? So that's the, the, that's the idea is to have this one click deployer uh, be able to be pushed into your PCF instance with little effort. Okay, so the question is, is the, uh, is the Redis uh, involved with Spinnaker, is that, is that part of doing the deployment or is that something that's outside of the environment? Uh, basically, Spinnaker needs one external dependency to do its job and that's uh, a Redis server. So right now, you have to go into PCF, in this case my dev workspace, create a Redis instance, and then I need the name of that typed into here to bind to it. So that's something to tackle is, um, you know, do we need to actually add support to say, go type in the name and have the deployer actually create the instance for you if it's not there? That may definitely be a feature that gets added to it. Um, so I think I saw a question back here. Yes, sir? How do you integrate with? How do you integrate with? 
Concourse, okay, the, yeah, how do you integrate with Concourse? So I've been asked that question, I think, two dozen times since I got here. Um, so there's, there's definitely overlap in what, you know, if you look at the big picture, what does Concourse do, what does Spinnaker do? So, um, you know, Concourse, I haven't directly used Concourse, but I've been able to, to look at it from a high level. So you can use Concourse to build, to essentially build a pipeline of operations that you're gonna do. Uh, so you can use it for CI or, you know, building, building an entire pipeline for release. So I think there's, um, you know, there's merit. Some teams like to be able to build, build with Concourse. I've, I've heard people that revel in using that. Um, but I've also seen a lot of teams that they look at Spinnaker and they say, I, I love the look of that thing. And I, I'm all in favor of let's move to the pipeline that you like best, but let's, let's get away from using tools like Jenkins and trying to engineer pipelines inside Jenkins because that's not what Jenkins was built for. And a pipeline deployment strategy is not what Travis was built for. So if down the road, if 80% of the software development community is using Spinnaker and 20% is using Concourse or the other way around, I, I think that'll be a big improvement. And let's see what, let's see what comes out of that. Um, it would be, it's, it's possible to add support to Spinnaker to go, if you want to use Concourse as your, CI tool to do your build jobs, and do we need Spinnaker to pull Concourse to, to get artifact, you know, to be triggered by that to then do deployments? Uh, but we have not added support for that yet, but to my understanding, that's probably not too hard to go code up. But I'm curious to see customers, is there any customer demand for that yet? I haven't heard that demand yet, but if it, if it arises, we can add it. Um, so was the, the question is, let me see if I got it right, are what, what all types of applications are people using Spinnaker to deploy? Uh, the, the circle of influence that I've, I've roamed in has been typically Java-based applications, but uh, there's, Spinnaker's not confined to only do um, those kind of applications. Essentially, with the Cloud Foundry support, you really point to a repository location like S3 and say, go get that artifact. I'm grabbing it in this demo, I'm grabbing a jar file and pushing it, and I'm letting the actual CF push job go and look at the artifact and deduce what build pack to use. Uh, so it, it deduces, oh, I need to use the Java build pack, but there's nothing that doesn't say I could be grabbing a Node.js bundle, grabbing that and pushing that and letting CF push deduce that I need to use the Node.js build pack on that. Um, so, I mean, it should support, should be polyglot and support any of the platforms that the underlying platform will support. Um, I don't actually, I haven't actually used the other cloud providers because Cloud Foundry is, you know, the best plat platform to go to, but, um, uh, so I really can't comment on precisely what their support level is. So the question is, is uh, uh, Spinnaker is based on Cassandra? Is that, is that what you're asking? Okay, so the question is, is uh, um, to your understanding, Spinnaker uses Redis and Cassandra. That was an accurate statement about a month ago, but I actually invested effort to um, make the storage engine optional. You could pick Cassandra or Redis so that in this configuration, I could say, we're not going to use Cassandra. We want to store everything in Redis so we have one external dependency. So you can actually go in and configure and, and pick that. And there's other shops that actually wanted to move away from Cassandra as well. Okay, so the question is, is exactly what does support does Spinnaker have when it comes to building or, or running scripts or what have you based on triggered events? Because in this example, I showed a trigger being get. Um, Spinnaker does have a script engine available, so you can have it run scripts at various stages. 
So you could definitely have it, and one of the other steps is it can run a Jenkins job. You can command it to run a Jenkins job along the way. So those are two avenues to do it. They do have explicit Docker support in there to essentially bake a Docker image, if that's what your platform is gonna actually deploy with. Um, but you know, the, the fundamental build an artifact thing uh, with the CI solution is it's, it's, it's definitely in the corner to say, I'm going to monitor, I'm gonna pull Jenkins for built artifacts or I'm gonna pull Travis for built artifacts. So if, if your build job is covered by that paradigm very smoothly, I mean, that would be my first recommendation before handwriting scripts to, that would do the same thing. I don't know, over. Oh, so, okay, so the question is, is uh, you're talking about like scaling up in the sense of uh, pipelines running or? It absolutely is built to handle, you know, we're running 100 different pipelines simultaneously. There's a checkbox setting in your pipeline to say whether or not this pipeline can run concurrently. Do you, does this pipeline need to only run one at any one time? And you can you could have hundreds of pipelines defined for your infrastructure. So any one of those can be triggered and you can go into the UI and you can quickly flange down and say, well, I'm only interested in these particular set of pipelines because they're uh, uh, for me. Um, there's a, a feature over here called projects where I can click on this. I have, uh, this is my dashboard for CF Summit where I can say I'm only interested in this particular app and if I had hundreds of other pipelines and uh, groups, they would not be shown on here. So it, it gives me a, a quick UI to look at what I'm interested in. Can you also, uh, the question I have is, uh, can you combine the apps into one pipeline or is just one app, one pipeline? You can really, you, uh, the question is, is like, can I combine all the apps into one pipeline? Do I need to have multiple pipelines? It's really any way you want to slice and dice it. The, um, if I go into like this uh, configuration pipeline, uh, let me go to the, pull up the, the pipeline definition. Uh, the, uh, the deploy step here, um, this, this box right here defines what's being rolled out. In this case, I only have one thing, but if I, I could have a, um, like a four piece microservice where I need to deploy all four components in here, I could either list all four items in here in this single deploy step or I could actually have four different deploy stages and I can have my pipeline fan out and then have it fan back in if I want to do it that way. And I can give, you know, I can give them each a different strategy. Like in this microservice, I want to keep two predecessor copies. This other microservice, I want to keep one. Um, or you know, if I want to, I can break them off into, I could have different pipelines for different apps, maybe different, some of the apps need to go through more complex procedures like with QA or something like that. So it's really very flexible in how you want to define your pipelines. Uh, was there another question? Yeah. Um, so the question is, is, is this just for PCF or is this for open source? Um, this all works with any, any certified Cloud Foundry because it uses the public APIs to interact with Cloud Foundry. So I'm showing it on PCF, talking to PCF, but this one, this one click deployer would work on any Cloud Foundry. It will install Spinnaker to any Cloud Foundry and it will deploy to any Cloud Foundry. Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. When you build a pipeline, can you have a text-based representation? And that is something I love very much, which is why well, I'm a big fan of stuff like Travis. Um, anytime you go into the pipeline, you know, I, I like the UI version of this thing uh, I can look at, but uh, there's actually under here, I can pull up the JSON representation for it. And we actually show steps of, um, I'm gonna migrate all my pipelines from Cassandra to Redis. I can run a curl command to pull it down all my pipelines, and it's a, a fistful of JSON that I can turn around and push into, into Redis uh, through, the, through the Spinnaker modules. So uh, this is actually an editor. I can go in and hand edit this like this uh, directly. And you know, it's not actually that hard to figure out. Um, so there's times when I, there was, you know, there were definitely like, I've, I've encountered bugs in the UI where 
it goofed something up and the UI didn't work and I just pulled up the JSON and, and corrected it directly. So to me, that, it's kind of a best of both worlds in my opinion. Okay, so the, the question is, is what, what kind of access controls are there? It's like, is everybody able to access everything? And right now, in general, that's yes, because that's kind of how Netflix operates, but there, there's developments underway as this is being uh, pushed into more enterprise shops and stuff where that, that solution's not gonna fly. So there's actually, they're working on making sure we have proper security controls around all the modules. Um, I've chatted with a handful of people that are like, we need, we need to go put in some controls and say, this person's authorized to work on these pipelines, that person's authorized for that, because there's definitely shops that need that kind of stuff. Um, I think I need to wrap it up, because I got, because I've uh, overused my time here, so I need to let the other person get set up, but we can keep talking about it outside here, and you can come up and get your stickers, all right? So everybody, thanks for turning up.